This morning's reading is from Jeremiah 23, verses 1 to 6, and it's on page 782 in the Church Bible. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity to share the, in the joy with Samuel as he's baptized. We pray now that our hearts and minds will be open to hear from you this morning as we explore your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is, of course, a celebration. Not only are we marking the occasion of Samuel's baptism, But we also come to the final Sunday of the church year. It's a chance for us to think back on the last 12 months and see how things have changed. And I'm aware that this year has uh, has been a big one for Christchurch. And lots of different things have happened. But as we come to this point at the end of the year, the church year that is, it's time to think about what lies ahead. As you know, we've got a few things lined up in the coming weeks. We've got the Advent Challenge to read through the Gospel of Luke. We've got upcoming Christmas services. We've got Chris Dingle, a carol service, midnight service, Christmas Day. We've got the Christmas cards that are going out to the houses around the parish, and every house in this parish will get a Christmas card. But as you, put it, as you uh, take the Christmas card, I don't just want you to put it through the letterbox. I don't want you to knock on the door, don't worry. But I want you to pray As you put it through the letterbox, just pray for God's blessing on that family so that we know that every house in this parish will have received a card and will have been prayed for. And if you're not in this parish, then help yourself to cards. There's plenty left. They're at the back outside outside in the foyer. So do help yourself and hand them to people who you think might, might appreciate one. As you saw in the video, once we get to Christmas, we'll then be following the star into the new year. And then we'll be looking at the vision to see what God has in store for us. And I'm really excited by this. And I hope you are too. That as we join in this journey together through Advent, as we read the Bible, as we go and follow the star, we'll then be in a place where we can see, well, what's God actually calling us to do in this new year? The new calendar year I'm talking about now. There's lots happening. And God is clearly on the move. And I think what we want to do in in creating a vision is actually be able to spend time saying, well, this is what we think God is calling us to do, but also planning it so that we're not trying to do everything all in January, but actually we're able to to say, well, this is what we really feel that God's calling us to do, but maybe it's six months down the line. Maybe this is 12 months down the line. Now, personally, I don't celebrate the new year. I go to bed at the usual time, and I try my hardest to sleep through all the inevitable fireworks. To me, it's just another day. But on the secular New Year's Eve, lots of people will attend parties, and they make New Year's resolutions, and most will probably be broken within a few days. Every year, I try to make a resolution to lose weight. You can see how well that's working. (laughs) But why do people attend those parties and celebrate? Because there's a sense of anticipation. There's a sense of a fresh start and a chance to change things. 
So here we are. And what I think in some ways is the church equivalent to New Year's Eve. It's the last Sunday of the church year. It's a Sunday where we celebrate Christ the King. It brings to a climax the entire church year. Because the church year begins on Advent Sunday. Hasn't come out very well. It's much better on that one. The church year begins on Advent Sunday. And it starts with that time of waiting and anticipation. Not only for meeting the Christ child at Christmas time, but the expectation of his second coming. That we know he will return and he will come again. We then move into Christmas. And we celebrate the Christ child over the 12 days of Christmas. We then get to Epiphany, where we welcome the wise men. And we continue through January, and then we get to Jesus being presented in the temple, which isn't actually shown on here, but it's in that Epiphany bit, January and February, where we meet Anna and Simeon, and we get the wonderful words of the Nunc Dimittis. Of course, we then move forward on to Lent, where we reflect on ourselves and our sinful nature, and start to think about the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. And then we get the resurrection. And then we celebrate the risen Christ, meeting different people in those 40 days before he ascends into heaven. Then we get those 10 days between ascension and Pentecost where we pray, thy kingdom come. We join with Christians across the world praying, thy kingdom come. And it brings to an end, in some ways, the story of Jesus. And then we get the rest of the year. Ordinary time. I'm not sure I like the term ordinary time. But as you can see, it then focuses on the story of the people of God. So we spend time looking at Jesus. Then we spend time looking at ourselves. And today, we reach that climax. And we celebrate Christ the King. We know that Christ will return. And we know that when he does, his kingdom will be fully realized. And I think it's one of the reasons it's at the end of the church year, is this celebration of Christ the King. Because next, year, next week even, we start to look with expectation at the return of Jesus. And we begin that wonderful season of Advent, which the world has lost. But the reading from Jeremiah we had this morning points to that time. It points to that time when the kingdom is fully realized. And as I've reflected and pondered on this passage over the week, it's got me thinking, well, actually, we're not much different to what it was like then. It's describing the situation and the circumstances that we're in now. We're a scattered people. And whilst we in this country might never know what exile is like in the biblical times, In many ways, I believe we are living in exile. We're not home, and we know we're not home. And everywhere we look, Christianity is being pushed out of the mainstream, and secularism is taking over. Just this week in the news, parents won their right to remove children from assemblies due to Christian input and prayers. And as I searched for this on Google, I came across the Humanist UK website, And I thought, well, that might be interesting. I clicked on it, and I wish I hadn't, because it made for damaging reading. We need to be praying. They, I think their line was, we will continue to campaign until Christianity and religion is removed from all of our schools. That cannot happen. We're living in exile. Now, I feel I should say, I'm not trying to downplay the use of this word, Because I know there are brothers and sisters in this world who are actually living in exile and are persecuted for their faith and have to flee their countries. So I'm not trying to downplay any of that at all. But I'm using it in the sense of, for us, as Western Christians in the UK now, it feels like we're in exile. Things have got worse since the introduction of technology and how digital we've become. Because whilst it may be that we're more connected than ever before, we're more lonely than ever before. There is much more isolation, loneliness. And social media has created a space where people feel they're entitled to share their views no matter how damaging and no matter how much it upsets the person next to them. And to be honest with you, I've come to a point where I've stopped reading those things. I've found the Facebook piece where it says, snooze or block but don't unfriend. Because it's too damaging. Now, 
Debate is, of course, healthy. We know that. Discussing big issues with those of different viewpoints is actually a really good thing to do because it helps us understand where different people are coming from. And I think that is really important in our world now when there are so many different views that we do have those debates. Just this week, I was at uh, Luton Airport. Um, I was invited to be on a panel of multi-faith leaders, um, and we were talking about how would you respond in an emergency situation. Now, I had 24 hours notice. It was supposed to be Bishop Richard going, and there was a plea that went out to close. So I only had 24 hours notice. These other people had about three or four weeks. But as I reflected, I thought, well, that's good, because if an emergency happened, if the phone went and said, there's been, I hope this never happens, but there's been a plane crash at Luton Airport, your local clergy, can you come? I wouldn't have time to think, okay, well, let me work out what reading am I going to use, what am I going to do, you know, which books do I need, what do I need? I'd just get up and go. But that's by the by. But it was interesting to be able to sit with other faith leaders and talk about how we would respond in those situations. That is healthy. Arguments on Facebook really aren't. So no disrespect, but if you have posted something that I feel personally is antagonistic, or I will mute it. I'm not trying to say I'm moving myself away from it, but anything that is not healthy, I will remove. Now, as you know from my licensing, this is one of my big areas of interest is social media and how we as Christians should approach it. Well, I've personally signed the digital charter of the Church of England as I wanted to pledge to only post things which are, uh, which are helpful, which are loving and generous, hopefully in the same way that I would speak to somebody face to face. And if you use social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, I'd encourage you to go onto this website, have a look and see if you're able to sign up to that and agree to sign up to it. Because we can make it a better place. The world we live in has caused us to be a scattered people. And that reading from Jeremiah reminds us that it's not new for God's people to be in exile or to be scattered. Jeremiah tells the story of Judah from when he became a prophet to the time of the Babylonian conquest and into some of the exile. The passage we had today is our proclamation of the coming Messiah who will bring together his people. The previous kings had failed. And how does the reading start? Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Very strong words. The leaders of the people had not been seeking the Lord's will and seeking guidance from him. They weren't doing that. The kings of the time had abused their power and this had led to people being scattered. Well, abuse of power is not something that's uncommon to us. Each and every one of us sat here has power in some way, some form or another. We can all choose to exert that in different ways. But in the past, power was earned. You earned that place of respect. Whereas now it seems to be a given. It's expected. All we need to do is pick up our phone turn on our computer, all that information is there. I've started reading a book this week by Andrew Greystone called Too Much Information. It's looking at the advance of the digital world and how we can navigate through it as Christians. Because we're more connected than ever to each other and boundaries are also disappearing. School bullying used to take place in the playground and it would stop. Now I'm afraid to say it happens 24-7, cyberbullying. And it's harrowing, some of the things that you hear. The boundaries of things that happen have gone. In the first chapter, Andrew talks about computers. Not so long ago, a computer was a thing that just sat in your house. It didn't know about anything else in the world. It would sit there, you'd type on it, you'd print something out, and that would be that. You could play games, perhaps. But it wasn't connected to anything else. Whereas nowadays, computers don't really work unless they're connected they have to be connected, whether by wires or wirelessly. We don't go to the shop anymore and buy software for a computer. I remember you used to get it in boxes like this size. But we don't go and buy those anymore. All we do is we go onto the internet, 
we type our website address in, we click the button that says pay, we use money that we've never seen, it's just figures from a bank account, then using other figures, and that you buy something, and then you download it, and within five minutes, depending on your internet connection, you've got some new software. That never used to happen. We go to our computers, and we can pull up YouTube, Netflix, whatever. We can watch all sorts of things on there, good and bad. That never used to happen. We can do all of that and still have no human interaction. So in those two circumstances that I've just described, where is the power? Who has authority over it? Well, what I've described, it doesn't have anyone in control. Of course, people were involved in making the software and someone put it online to be downloaded. But the entire process is completely automated. It's taken humanity out of the equation. If I go to the co-op next door, I can go in. I can find what I want. I can take it up to one of the tills on the left. I can scan it. I can use my phone and pay. And I can walk out again. No human interaction. Or when I go to Tesco's or Sainsbury's or Asda, I can pick up one of these scanning devices. And I can go around and I have no human interaction. Everything is becoming more and more automated. Where's the power in this automation? There is nobody in control of it. And of course, when you scan your shopping on one of these things or at the till, it then automatically uploads a database back in the back office that automatically reorders the, shop, the, what, the stock so that the next day it will automatically turn up on the truck. Well, it won't automatically, because obviously it needs to be driven, but the truck will turn up with the, with the stock so that they don't go out of stock. It's scary. And another scary statistic that Andrew mentions in his book is this. 4.1 billion people in the world have a mobile phone contract. That's 60% of the world's population. And look at the bottom. More people have a mobile phone than a flushing toilet. What's gone wrong? What's wrong with that? It can often feel, when we look at things like that, that we're living in a world where things have got so big and anonymous that we're like fish swimming in a little corner of the sea trying to tell each other about the oceans of the world. We need the reminder that above all of these systems, whether human or machine, we have Jesus Christ as king. We can bow down before him, surrender to him, and ask him to help, uh, help guide us through the world that is changing so quickly. He can help us show out who those shepherds are, perhaps leaders of our nations who are destroying and scattering the sheep. It's too easy for us to find leaders that suit our ideas and suit our understandings. And be very vocal about it when actually all we're trying to do is live together in harmony. And I believe that's one of the reasons we're so divided as a country as well. Do you remember when general elections happened before the internet and Facebook? Just about old enough. There was party political broadcasts. Five minute slot on the telly. Somebody come in and knocking at the door. Or we'd read and hear about it in the media. But nowadays, as soon as somebody said something, it's headline news. Millions of people are then on Facebook and social media trying to minutely analyze what was meant, what tone of voice was used, what did they actually mean, what was meant behind that statement. There's too many people vying for power. So we, as God's people, need to come back together under that authority of Jesus Christ, the King, and learn to live with each other and learn to accept our differences. Amanda and I agree on most of the big things in life. But there are things that we disagree on. But it doesn't come between our relationship. Disagreement can be healthy. But it must never, become, never come between a friendship or a relationship. Because after all, life would be boring if we all had the same views. But what we must do is come under that authority and power of Jesus Christ. I've said it before, because I've heard it from other things, but we as a country are at a crossroads. We have an election coming up that probably carries more weight than previous ones, and it will determine where we go as a country. 
Whatever happens on the 12th of December, some people will be happy, others will be sad. So I want to encourage each and every one of us as a church to be praying for that outcome. As you go to the the polling station, pray for who you feel it's right to vote for. This isn't going to become a political broadcast, by the way. But pray that as you put that mark on your ballot paper in whichever box you want, pray that it feels right between you and God. Make sure you've read things that come through the door properly. Because behind a lot of these wonderful things that they're saying, there's other things that will be very damaging to the Christian faith in this country. So read things properly. I'm sure you do anyway. But the crossroads we're at needs us to make a noise, to cry out to God for his help and his guidance. And yesterday I started looking through Luke's gospel. And would you believe what passage it is on chapter 12, which will be the 12th of December? Do not worry. It starts with the warnings and encouragements. Do not worry. Be watchful. Interpret the times. Very relevant for what we will face as a country. So let's cry out to God. Because we know that God can change the course of human events because he's so much bigger than us. I know here as a church, there's, you've been through difficult times. I know that we've lived through difficult issues. And I've now had the opportunity to sit and listen to most house groups. I've not quite made it round yet. But I know people have said to me they've held on by their fingertips because of the house groups. But we can't dwell on that. That was part of our history. We have to acknowledge that. But now's the time to look forward and see what God is calling us to do. And this is where we start. This is where I want us to start with the vision in the new year. He's looking forward. What's God, where does God want to take us now? So as we reach the end of this church year, can I encourage all of us, me included, to surrender ourselves again to Jesus Christ. To put him as the king of the new church year. To put him as king of our lives, as king of this church, as king of Luton, as king of the nation. We've all declared with Samuel and his family this morning the faith of the church. We've all declared and said in this building that we trust in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Samuel has put Christ first in his life as he's been baptized into our family today. So let us take heart from this. And let's do the same for ourselves. No matter how long we've been following Jesus, let's put Jesus back at the center of our lives. Because when we do that, God will raise people up. We can look back at times in the Bible where God's people have been in exile or difficult situations. And God has always raised someone up. Moses. David, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Peter from the Bible, and in more recent times, Martin Luther, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you or me. Could we join that list and be one of God's people that's speaking out, that's being the prophetic voice of what's to come? We too can make the prophetic call to the world to come home, to stop following the shepherds who are destroying and scattering, but to come home to the true shepherd, The one who died for us on that cross at Calvary. No matter where we go, we eventually need to come home. And we know that to get home, we follow Jesus Christ, the King. He knows the way in. He knows the grace and power of God. The power of God that attends to those leaders who do evil. In verse 2, this is Jeremiah. The power of God that gathers the remnant of the flock. Verse 3 out of the lands and the power of God that brings us all back to the fold. You can't read that. And declares that the flock will be fruitful and multiply in a new time of abundance. This, I believe, is what the Lord is saying to us as we seek to begin this new church here together. That God will raise people up here in Christ church to help shepherd the people of God. To bring into our midst those who may be afraid, those who may be dismayed, those who may have been missing. The power of us, the people of God, will be secure in the power of God. 
for the Lord will be the righteousness of the people. So the question for us then is how do we know the righteous shepherd king? Well, as Advent approaches, these words may help. Thou shalt know him when he comes, not by any din of drums, nor his manners, nor his airs, nor by anything he wears. Thou shalt know him when he comes, not by crown or by gown, but his coming known shall be by the holy harmony which his coming makes in thee. Thou shalt know him when he comes. Amen. I believe that is an anonymous Advent hymn. I couldn't find anyone who it was attributed to. So as we reflect on the year that's been, a significant one for Christchurch, a significant one for Amanda and I as we've joined you, let's remember that Christ is the king of our lives. As we rejoice with Samuel this morning, as he begins his journey of faith with Jesus at the center, let's remember that we too need Jesus at the center of our lives that Jesus is king and he will come again. We're going to pray the collect that the Church of England has set for today to conclude the talk this morning. So let's pray. Eternal Father, whose Son Jesus Christ ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King, keep the church in the unity of the Spirit, and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.